that we can start with our like 80 people uh, on the webinar. Uh, I will go with a short introduction uh, regarding the ZEV Innovation Project uh, and after me two presentations will follow. Uh, after each presentation we will have like a session uh, of uh, very quick uh, questions, one or two, and at the end of the second uh, presentation uh, you can uh, ask more questions, but also during the pre uh, presentation you can ask uh, uh, questions and we will uh, then I will ask our presenters. So uh, once more, hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Boris Josic. I'm coming from a Center of Technology Transfer, Croatia. Uh, we are lead partner of uh, ZEV Innovation Project. Uh, ZEV Innovation is the short name of the Strengthening Trust National Cooperation, Knowledge and Technology Transfer in Development of Electric Vessels and Fostering Innovation in SMEs. So title of our plenary session is Exploring Application of Zero Emission vessel in, uh, Vessels in Maritime. Uh, in the sh as a short introduction, uh, we will have. I will uh, look about the project and program, about project partners, uh, about CTT, about the plenary session lectures, a uh, short review of battery technology, and uh, at the end uh, uh, we will present our presenters. So about the project and the program. Uh, the ZEV Innovation Project is funded by uh, Iceland, uh, Liechtenstein, and Norway through the EA and Norway Grants Fund uh, for regional cooperation. Uh, total project uh, budget is 1.6 uh, million euros. Uh, the main priority of the fund uh, was innovation, research, education, and competitiveness. So we are trying to connect everything in our project. We are looking for the innovation. We are trying to connect research and SMEs. Uh, and also to uh, educate, uh, to, to have uh, different webinars, uh, to participate on different conferences, to share the knowledge about uh, zero emission vessels uh, and about uh, uh, electric hydrogen and uh, fuels uh, beyond the hydrogen. Uh, project, uh, program fund uh, uh, regional cross-border and transnational cooperation because uh, fund see that this is the very important and it's the easiest way to reach uh, to reach a solution of uh, zero emission uh, uh, vessels because of that uh, we have partners from croatia poland and norway in order to share the knowledge and in order to transfer the knowledge uh, in total over 700 application uh, 20 projects were uh, were selected and uh, one lead uh, project lead partner from croatia uh, CTT in this case for the ZEV Innovation uh, Project. Uh, project duration is 43 months. We are starting now. Uh, we spent the first six months in the researching the sector, connecting with the stakeholders. And now in this year, we will have a series seri of uh, uh, webinars in order to present uh, in more details uh, topics and to see how to help uh, different stakeholders and how to connect uh, different stakeholders. As I said, uh, we had the partners from three countries and in total uh, five partners uh, participating in the project. So lead partner is the Center of Technology Transfer from Croatia. Uh, uh, we have uh, three beneficiary partners, uh, Croatia, uh, from Croatia two, from uh, Poland one, Baltic Sea and Space Cluster, uh, and we have two expertise partners who are actually transferring knowledge from uh, Norway to Croatia and uh, and uh, and the Poland. Because of that, we always have on our workshops presenters from Norway in order to share uh, knowledge in this sector because they are uh, ahead of other countries uh, in the zero emission uh, vessels. So we have expertise partner OKP experts in the technology and the Vinco innovation expert in the innovation. So short introduction to CTT, uh, funded in 96 by the University of Zagreb Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture. So we are 100% owned by the uh, faculty. Uh, what are strategic purpose of this, uh, of uh, Center of Technology Transfers? To connect science and economy. So our idea is to connect companies with uh, researchers on the faculty and help them uh, in the funding the projects uh, in the writing the projects, in the in the developing new projects, 
to enhance the competitiveness of Croatian industry uh, by helping to connect with the researchers. Uh, we are, want to strengthen the role of uh, University of Zagreb, Faculty of Mechanical Engineering in this process. Uh, and we are Center for Innovation Technology Transfer. We are uh, helping uh, stakeholders and the researchers in the field of innovation and technology transfer. So what are our main activities are transfer of knowledge into economy through the different project. And we also lifelong learning. Uh, we have a lot of uh, seminars, webinars where presenters and organizers are professors from the faculty and attendees on these seminars are coming from SMEs. Uh, we also have incubation and acceleration of uh, SMEs uh, of entrepreneur ideas. So we have an uh, incubator for startup and spin offs. Uh, and we also have the student incubator. What is the project aim and the potential of the project? So everything is playing with uh, zero emission vessels. So, and we are trying to connect uh, companies, connect research organization, and everything we want to happen through this, uh, our innovation hub, which is the main uh, field of, uh, of our project, place where we will have the uh, possibility to connect, share, and uh, uh, work together between uh, different stakeholders. So, as I said, this is the establishment of efficient and sustainable network, uh, involvement of uh, multidisciplinary partners, researchers, uh, SMEs, uh, and from different sectors. Uh, working on uh, collaboration, uh, supporting market uptake of uh, ZEVs, and uh, the, we are offering uh, tailored expertise to, to selected companies. We want to help them to commercialize their ideas, uh, and we want to uh, work together for uh, application for the new projects. And as a short introduction to this uh, webinar today, uh, I will present some uh, uh, results from our last paper regarding the electric batteries using electric uh, using batteries in electric uh, uh, electric ferry boats. So we uh, analyzed three uh, routes in Croatia uh, with 1.6 nautic miles, 8 mile nautic miles, and 30 nautic miles. Ship one, two, and three. Uh, connecting different islands uh, in Croatia. So we analyzed the uh, existing system uh, compared with uh, three different uh, technology of batteries, lead acid, nickel, and lithium ion batteries. Uh, we uh, analyzed life cycle assessment and life, cost, uh, life cycle cost assessment. We used European electric mix. So uh, it's on the European level. Uh, on, if you go for the national, of course, it is no problem. So our idea was to see how much everything uh, costs, uh, what is the influence. And uh, if we look uh, uh, regarding the different ship, different routes. So if you look results, uh, CO2 emissions, of course, uh, batteries reducing. You don't have uh, emission from the operating of the ship, but you have a lot of emission in the production because we use European mix. If you go to 100% of renewable electricity, uh, these emissions of CO2 probably will be reduced. Uh, this is the result of the analysis for ship one, two, and three. As you can see, uh, SOX uh, uh, nickel uh, batteries have a lot of uh, SOX because of the manufacturing process. Uh, the most important thing is also is LCCA uh, comparison. So you can see uh, ship one, two, and three uh, operation uh, costs are lower, but uh, here we are facing the problem of the size of the batteries. Uh, so it's like eight megawatt hours of the size of the batteries in the ship number three. So this is actual comparison between short and long ships, uh, uh, what is happening in the, when you analyze the system. So, and because of that, uh, our next uh, presentation uh, will uh, cover uh, first part is uh, with electric uh, uh, ships, uh, uh, typically used for the uh, shorter destination. And uh, Anders will uh, present after uh, batteries and hydrogen, uh, how to uh, work and how to design your system, what are other options beside of uh, uh, batteries and hydrogen. So this is for me for the introduction. 
Uh, our next presenter will be Tomo, uh, Tomislav Uroda from uh, iCAD company. So Tomo, floor is your. Uh, I will stop uh, sharing. So I think you can start now for uh, with uh, with your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can see my screen and you can hear me well. We had some technical issues before. Uh, my name is Tomis Lavord. I'm coming from the ICAT company. ICAT stands for Island Catamaran, and this is the, uh, it was startup company some 10, 15 years uh, ago. Um, if we take a look uh, of, the, of the main idea why we have started company, that was the challenge from the Croatian market, and that is Thousand Island without uh, efficient uh, transportation network. Uh, I'm saying that one because uh, I believe the market potential is very important for the uh, R&D activities. So if you are developing any, any kind of innovation, you have to see clear market for that, uh, for that kind of uh, innovation. Uh, regarding the, the, the electric vessels and the zero emission vessels, and that is something which is happening now, a bit before it was in Norway, and now it's coming on the other, uh, on the other countries in the world. Um, as I told you, we have started some 15 years uh, ago. It was just the basic idea how to connect the islands. And then we realized that we have, as, as a small company, we have to set up the partnership with uh, R&D institutions. And that was the University of Zagreb and later on Conchar Institute. Conchar is a technical institute in, in Croatia. And we have been dealing with uh, Conchar Institute uh, in development of uh, electrical propulsion on, the, on the, the vessels. At the beginning, it was very challenging regarding the, the battery technology. Um, the example, the picture on the, on, on the um, right uh, down uh, corner of the screen, you will see the land plot of the Shibenik area, and this is the city which have asked us to develop a new system of transportation. And they said, yes, we would like to have it uh, with electric vessels. Uh, this is the market then, and this is the uh, market requirement for whom you can develop something like that. At that point, uh, we have been developing that with lithium batteries, I mean lithium uh, iron batteries, and uh, for the fast vessels, it was not feasible at the moment. Uh, in the second part of our short history, we have been dealing with several EU projects and we have finished all of them at the moment. We have set up our own production and we have built four uh, solar powered vessels uh on the picture you can see production and the one of the of the vessels um the first one solar cat this is the third generation of the uh, solar vessels we are building the first three vessels have been built for national national park of Mlet in croatia and they have been first and the second generation um this is that the experience uh from the uh, from the shipbuilding where you can see that you have improved that you can improve some uh, some parts of the systems um, very similar like in other uh, any other uh, uh, segment of, of production if you take a look at the, on, of the car industry over the hundred years they have been significant uh, improvement of the of the engines with regards to the speed that's that's mostly the speed of the of the cars and uh, sometimes it would be uh, it would be needed then you uh, for improving the uh, the vessels as well um, this small vessel is a, a catamaran 15 meter uh, length five meter wide and it has small engines uh, two times 12 kilowatts we can uh, upgrade that one to the high power but the basic idea here was to have self-sustainable vessel that means with those small engines, with optimized uh, uh, hull resistance and the weight of the vessels, we uh, we have the cruise speed five to six knots and uh, maximum speed almost ten uh, knots. Um, on the screen here, you will see some data about this vessel. 
uh, the name of that one was baby cat. Solar cat is the third generation, which follows the, the baby cat uh, vessel, as I told you before. And on the screen, you can see uh, deliveries of uh, new building number two and number three. Uh, new building number two was delivered in summer 2019, and we have been sailing from, uh, from Split uh, to, to Mlyat. This is the distance of 75 nautical miles. We were sailing 13 and a half hours with average speed five and a half knots. And the batteries at uh, the arrival remain at 50 to 60%. Then we have midwinter delivery. That was the early January, 2020. Uh, same speed, not the same distance. The distance was 62 nautical miles. Uh, um, 11 and a half uh, hours of sailing. That means sailing without stopping. And then we have drained the batteries almost completely, some 90%. Um, the solar cat, which is the, which is the next generation of that vessel has 30% more power in the batteries and 20% in the solar panels. Uh, emphasizing on those vessels is the, the solar energy. So they are sailing in a national park for some years already and they never recharge them. <coughs> uh, the only energy they need, they got it from the, from the sun. This is the second concept of the vessel we have designed and that would be the next one for us. This is the fast electric ferry. <coughs> that means we are not using the solar energy here because the roof space is pretty small with regards to the, the amount of energy we need for that vessel. But on this one, uh, the, we have design speed of 25 knots as a top, top speed, and then we have changed uh, battery technology, uh, aiming to have uh, batteries which are, uh, which are able to have uh, uh, high seas with regards to the charging and discharging. That means you can recharge them in, a, in, a, in a, some 10 minutes of, of time, and that would be the time when you are boarding and uh, you are in between uh, some stops. Some, such, a, such a kind of vessel uh, is the vessel for the short distance. That means distance up to 20 nautical miles, but I would say not 20, but some 10 to 15 nautical miles. <clears throat> and if we take a look on the Adriatic, it will be in between the islands. It will not be uh, for the... Uh, further islands we have in the Adriatic, but island connections in between, that would be the perfect ferry. Or it could be the part of the public transportation. Uh, in Norway, that would be the fjord connections. <clears throat> um, on, on such a vessel at this moment, with the technology we have it at the moment, I would say this is the uh, utmost you can use for the, for the batteries. And then the third concept would be combination of the batteries and the hydrogen. And this is the, the project idea we are developing at the moment with the University of Zagreb and it will be our third step. Um, the, the, the electric vessels, they are kind of uh, more priced than the normal classical diesel uh, internal combustion uh, vessels. And it's kind of similar, similar like the, uh, with the cars. So if you're buying the electric car, it's twice the price than the normal car. And here it's very important, the message you are sending to the market and to the customers. And uh, I would like to share with you one short movie. And uh, I am sharing that from the car industry and I hope you will hear the, the sound of it. If not, at least you will have the picture.
Um, probably didn't didn't get the sound on it. Uh, it but it, it, it's short commercial about the uh, uh, electric car, and basically it's not promoting the electric car. It's saying what would be if everything would run on gas. That means from uh, general home appliances and all the systems. Uh, and then this is the market approach. And if you take a look in the, in the past, if, if, um, and you are uh, quoting some of the famous people, then you have the Henry Ford who said, if I'd asked customer what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. Or if you go to the Steve Jobs, he said that people don't know what they want until you show it to them. That's why I never re rely on market research. Our task is to read things that are not yet on the page. And I would say the topics we are discussing now, it's right on, on, on the same track, like those guys in the, in the past. And here I'm finishing my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the time. So thank you, Tomo. So I have one, one, one uh, quick uh, question. Uh, your your boats. Uh, what is the average speed where you can have it the small and the, the, the big one? And uh, what is the how to say maximum distance with the full charger batteries in one direction? What we can expect. Well, for the small one, uh, the optimal uh, cruising speed would, would be five to six knots. Uh, it will increase a bit with the, with the technology of the solar cells, and this is going from day to day. They are increasing the, the, the energy uh, capacity from the, from the solars. Uh, if you increase the speed from, from five to six to nine, then consumption raise some four times so I would still stick to the, to the cruising speeds where you have complete uh, autonomy. And autonomy, we said it's 100 nautical miles per day. And uh, with such a speed, that would be the whole day, the whole day uh, of sailing. So you don't have uh, 50 hours per day in a way that you need more. So the, this, this is the optimal size. For that one, we can uh, increase the battery pack. It's not the big one, it's 50 kilowatt hours battery pack on uh, those solar cat vessels. So if you increase it uh, two or three times, you can increase the speed to seven and eight knots. Or if you are not sailing the whole day, you can increase it even to, to 10, 11 knots. That would be for solar cat. For the iCat vessel, mm, the, the top speed at the moment is 25 nautical miles, and that one is for half hour of sailing, and then you have to recharge it. Reducing okay. the speed significantly uh, increase the the, um, the 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 reach of the vessel, the autonomy uh, or nautical miles you can sail through. So uh, I have one or two questions from our uh, pan, uh, from my, from our attendees. So first question is: uh, these boats are all plastic material. And the yeah. second question is, what is the lifetime of the battery cell? So this is very actually interesting, the lifetime of uh, expected lifetime of your batteries. And uh, what is uh, expected from the producer? And what is the situation with uh, uh, live uh, using of these batteries from your experience? So you have experience because you have the data. So. Yeah, um, for the uh, lithium iron batteries, um, I have mentioned at the beginning that we have been calculating the options for the city of Shibenik, where that was the usage of lithium iron batteries on fast boats. And then the producer of the batteries has calculated that the lifetime would be less than a year. And then the same batteries uh, for the application we have right now, and that's this national park of Mlet, and the low speed is 15 plus years because uh, charging and discharging is uh, less than 1C and you are not damaging the batteries at all. So you're kind of taking care for them. And, and then in, we have switched to the another um, type of batteries and that's the LTO batteries on the another boat. That's because they are able to, to take uh, up to 7Cs uh, charging, discharging. Uh, but uh, for the lifetime, we have to calculate that one individually. 
on each case depending on the uh, on the type of usage. Uh, we are always aiming that batteries should uh, uh, last at least 10 years. And then I believe within 10 years, the technology of battery will be uh, uh, will be improved. And that that's something, if you compare the, the, the mobile phones, the first one, you have to carry the complete briefcase just for the battery. And now we have the small battery within the phone. And that is uh, my feeling that the, the, how the development will go. And if you ask me what kind of batteries and materials, I don't know that because this, this is much, uh, much more scientific research uh, re related to the such kind of institutions like, uh, like you have Marine Tech or we have Roger Boscovich in Croatia. And uh, for us, uh, we are just kind of um, system integrator. So we are looking how to optimize the, the, the shape and of the vessel, the resistance of the hull, and what, how to use the utmost solutions on the, on the market. So we are not developing the, the batteries. So I have a lot of questions, so I will, I will group them. So first group is uh, linked with the batteries. So which charger is needed at the dock to charge your ship? And how long it takes to fully charge the battery? for example, the first group. And the second group of the question is uh, uh, how the boat deals with the bad weather. Uh, and I have also a set of questions like uh, uh, how you solve stability in damage condition, how it's solved. Do you have emergency power gas installed, gas set installed, and uh, what safety solution are used to assure fire safety on board? So I know that you had a lot of experience with registering your boat. So I think that you can give very good uh, answer on these questions. So um, before of this, uh, before I have started the company, I have been working for the for the one company in Croatia established by Norwegian governments, and I was very close with development in Norway. And I know at that point of time. Uh, in Norway, the first LNG vessels has been built. And at the beginning, the LNG tanks has been on the rooftop of the vessels. And then over the years, they, they just move it down in, uh, in the hulls. Um, why I'm saying that? Because you have the register of shipping and those boats, both they are built under the register of shipping and uh, you are kind of creating or changing some, some rules together with them um, when we applied first time uh, for the for the new building uh, to the Croatian register of shipping, then we got the message from them, from them saying something like, um, uh, "Sailing with electric boats, it's not defined by the law, and we don't want to approve documentation at all." Um, then this communication has continued to, between the register shipping uh, ministry of C and us, and we finally managed to, to, to pass through to the next step and to approve the documentation. And then there was uh, a lot of requirements from the register shipping. And then this is the hard, hard part of the job. Uh, you have to convince somebody for whom this is the new technology that the boat will be safe enough. And then you are developing the, the risk assessment, uh, the classification of space and uh, the battery testing. And you have to prove it that the, the, the safety on the board will be on the required level. So from the battery point, you cannot buy the battery from, from China, for example. You have to have batteries which are approved by the register of shipping. And then uh, you, uh, the, the, the question was about the safety. So we have on this small boat, you have it here. You, you have seen it on, on, the, on, the, on the last slide. Uh, the, the first level is self extinguishing ampullas, which are all over the, the, the engine room and the battery compartment. The batteries are in individual compartment uh, and in this compartment, uh, no other equipment could be sold. That was the first uh, requirement. Then um, we have, of course, fire and steam we share all over the board. And then we have the sprinkle station for, the, for cooling the space. And we have the fire hose in the case of fire. So uh, talking with my friend who is the, 
the CEO of one uh, Norwegian company in Croatia, he told me this is the most safest board, uh, boat he ever been on because everything is about safety. And uh, those are the first steps and it will be huge requirements from the register shipping that you have the safety, uh, several safety levels uh, over some time until the technology would be proven in, in, in the practice. Uh, uh, then the second part of the question was charging and discharging. For this one, all the power you are getting from the solar panels, uh, uh, you can recharge them with short chargers, but we are using the, the, the slow chargers on that one. That means if it's a 50 um, kilowatt hours or 60, we have, we have basically 70 kilowatt hours on the latest one, uh, battery pack, you, you recharge it over the night. And that means some eight hours. With that one, you are keeping, uh, you are taking care for the batteries. You can do it with, within one hour and that would be for those kind of batteries to keep them uh, uh, on, 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 the, on the long uh, long life cycle. Uh, uh, redundancy or security, we don't have any kind of auxiliary pr propulsion or the diesel generator or anything like that. But the battery packs, they are divided in several of them. And then you have created the redundancy. If you have two engines and if we have two engine packs, then you can operate each of those engines by any of battery pack or you can uh, uh, operate uh, the boat engines with one battery pack. So you are creating redundancy with, with, with the different kinds of batteries. And then you also you can, you can create uh, different uh, string of the batteries and connect them individually to the, <clears throat> to the uh, engines or to the power cabinets. So if one battery goes, uh, goes off or it's out of the service, the other one uh, remains working. Also, we have one requirement from the register shipping and that is the monitoring system for the batteries. So at the beginning, we have developed the software for online monitoring. And then the next step was, uh, okay, the online monitoring is not uh, approved uh, by the register shipping. So you have to have it uh, on board. You have to have complete wired connection and all those security issues uh, registers requiring. And then we have been updating that software with different requirements from the register of shipping. And this is ongoing process together with them. Uh, you, are, you are doing that as a partner. So they said, okay, we, we would need to warning signals. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in the car industry, um, you would get the kind of battery warning, like the battery is empty. Uh, you can all, go on and on the vessels you cannot get something like uh the battery is over voltage or over temperature we are shutting down the battery because this is this is not feasible you uh, feasible you don't have the brakes on the boat so you have to have some kind of pre-warning system that means sometimes before the batteries will shut down uh fortunately we never experienced any kind of battery shutting down so far but uh, the installation for such a vessel is on the, on the higher, uh, higher level. There is lots of uh, uh, communication going through the, through the cables. And then you have the power cables and you have communications cable, communication cables. And it's much more of communication on, on such a vessel than on the normal one. Um, and the last year I was uh, in one, um, supervisory check of the vessels uh, operating uh, in south of Croatia. And then re I have realized that uh, those guys, the, the precip precipitation of um, how do you have to maintain the boats, it's completely different. So you are not getting the only mechanical guy who is uh, uh, working around in, with, with, with dirty hands and, and the oil can. But you, you need some IT guys because you are programming the, the, the engines, you are programming uh, the chargers, uh, the, the batteries, and then the uh, battery monitoring system, everything is IT on such a vessel now. And uh, from this point, you have to have uh, clear communication with the customers that they, they have to be aware that it's not now a mechanical part anymore. It's much more electrical and somebody with PC would have to maintain the boat. 
uh, charging the another boat, the, the fast boat, I told you that we have a speed of 25 knots and then the recharging time could be within 10 minutes. In that case, the charger has to be two megawatts. And then for two megawatts, you have to, you have, to have huge power supply or you have to additional battery set on, 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 on shore, uh, maybe connected with the solar plant. And this is then uh, uh, developing technology or charging technology which you have to agree with the final customers would they like to invest to to additional uh, power source like the solar plant on the shore and which will recharge a battery set on shore and then you can have you can have fast chargers without connecting to the to the power network in norway this is i would say much easier because you have a lot of uh, electrical energy in Croatia, the power network is not that strong, uh, and we don't have that much energy. So, um, putting the high power chargers on the on the electrical grid will uh, will cost you much more because you are paying for the for the for the for the peak power uh, installed power for uh, for the chargers. So thank you, thank you, Tomo. Uh, there are. Uh, few other questions, but I think that will uh, uh, stay after the presentation of others. Uh, one is linked also with the hydrogen. So please, uh, you know, uh, see and think what is the difference between batteries and hydrogen and your opinion of using of hydrogen. Because as I said, you had experience with registering electric, what will be hydrogen? Maybe you heard something, you know, so, question after Anders, uh, so we will answer. So thank you very much for interesting, uh, a lot of question. I will uh, write them down and ask after the presentation of Anders to have the like discussion. So thank you, Tomo. Uh, Anders, uh, floor is your uh, question we had about the hydrogen. So if you have something with the hydrogen in your presentation, of course, uh, but also after your presentation, uh, discussion before uh, starting of webinar about hydrogen it will be very good to talk after the your presentation to answer the question of the attendees so floor is yours thank you boris uh, so my name is uh, anders wallan i'm from uh, a research company in norway called sintef and a part of it called sintef ocean which is uh, uh, looking into all kinds of research questions on what's happening um, below the ocean, in the ocean, and above the ocean. Um, so we're looking both at, at uh, technical issues for ships, uh, we're looking at technical issues for um, exploiting oil and gas reserves that Norway has, and uh, also the biomarine harvesting of fish and uh, uh, algae and um, shells and so on. So. We're basically covering everything uh, in the ocean. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we call the fuels beyond hydrogen. And uh, we were having a slight discussion prior to this meeting where um, uh, it was mentioned that, well, uh, struggling with batteries and, and uh, making electric ships, uh, hydrogen is maybe uh, a way in the future. In Norway, we have been working a lot with uh, uh, electric ships and while it's not uh, it's relatively new also in Norway um, and all most of the issues that uh, that was mentioned in the previous presentation is, is also very much on the table in, in Norway um, in Norway we are also looking at um, hydrogen and it's been presented as as a possible future solution so that's why we want to talk about okay is there anything beyond that um, and then uh, before I start, I would like to mention uh, when it comes to this, um, um, uh, the electrical grid. Uh, yes, we have a lot of hydropower in Norway. We have a lot of energy, but we are also struggling with power. So electrical power is an issue and it's, uh, it's a really big issue. And it's, uh, that is what is going to cost a lot of money when you are electrifying more and more ships. Okay, um, let's see, get this. Um, there we go. Total CO2 emissions, if you look at global shipping, is about 3% um, uh, of uh, the global CO2 emissions. 
This is uh, a curve showing uh, what has been done in the IMO, the International Maritime Organization. They did several studies on CO2 emissions from shipping uh, and looking all the way back to 1990 and up to 2018. So four studies, uh, the second, third and fourth studies are shown here. Um, and they all uh, tend to agree on uh, the total amount of, uh, uh, of CO2 emissions from, from shipping. We have to have a, a, a certain image of uh, what is the challenge when it comes to shipping. This is global shipping again, and this is based on um, the uh, European Maritime Safety uh, Association's um, figures. So it's about 90,000 ships in a global uh, shipping fleet. Uh, above uh, 500 gross tons. Um, and the most important part of this uh, uh, image is, is the one to the right, because it shows what the current fuel mix in uh, global shipping is today. So global shipping consumes approximately 300 million tons of oil equivalents per year. As you know, with COVID and everything, things have changed. But in a normal year, it would be uh, something around 300 million tons of oil equivalents. And this is uh, distributed as three quarters is heavy fuel oil. And uh, if you look at this uh, small slice of 2%, LNG and others, that's where you find LNG, methanol, LPG, and batteries. And you couldn't show, for instance, batteries in this because it wouldn't basically show in this figure. It's, it's uh, that small yet. Um, the other figure that's uh, quite interesting is if you look at uh, the, the middle one, you will see that uh, this is uh, uh, then uh, um, set up as uh, a percentage of which vessels have huge engines. So it basically says that about uh, approximately 30% of the ships in the world use approximately 80% of the fuel. And these are the 30% biggest ships. So that's where we need to, to really uh, get going if we, need to, if we want to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, there are basically uh, three types of um, measures to reduce carbon intensity. You could do something on design and technical improvements of the ship. You could do operational improvements um, uh, in how you utilize the ships and the capacity of the ships. Or you could switch to fuels with either zero or low or very low greenhouse gas footprints, for instance, as batteries. And this is what I'm, I will be talking a little bit more about. It's, it's also good to know, uh, so what's happening with the International Maritime Organization and, and ship emissions and climate impacts. So presently they are regulating nitrous oxides and sulfuric oxides. And these are human health and local pollution issues. And they're quite big. Shipping in total in, uh, globally um, stands for about 15, 1.5% of all local air pollution on this planet, 15%. While on, on climate gas, it's 3%, 2 to 3%. Uh, the IMO prohibits deliberate emissions of ozone depleting substances, and it regulates CO2 emissions through the Marple Annex uh, 6. And it's also important, I'll get back to this, but the IMO regulations are on what we call a tank to wake basis. So it's the emissions that come from the ship alone. So it's from the fuel that's on the ship and that's uh, what IMO is looking at. But they are now getting uh, under increased pressure to also include other gases than CO2 into greenhouse gases, for instance, methane and laughing gas, N2O. And they're also under pressure to uh, include what's called a life cycle analysis on the fuels on a well to wake basis, that is from the production of the fuel and all the way until it, uh, the energy is dissipated through the propeller. So this is quite important. If you look at this figure, um, it illustrates the difference between what we call the tank to wake and the well to wake. Uh, looking at uh, tank to wake and CO2 only as IMO does today, and the well to wake looking at CO2 uh, equivalents. In the upper figure, you will see that LNG, for instance, um, and LNG is, is, a, is a highly debated topic these days. 
LNG will give you approximately 24 to 25% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions compared to marine gas oil. If you look at the tank to weight and CO2 only perspective. If you include what's known as the well to tank, so the production and distribution emissions for the fuels, you will see that the figures are different. So what we call the dual fuel auto cycle engine on LNG has approximately a 4% benefit compared to marine gas oil, while in the previous figure, it had a 24% um, um, benefit. While the dual fuel diesel cycle engine uh, has approximately a 16% benefit compared to marine gas oil, if you look at the well to wake, compared to what the IMO is doing today, where it looks like it has a 25% um, benefit. Switching to fuels with zero or lower greenhouse gas footprints, we can go all the way from uh, conventional fossil fuels. I've al already shown you that some of them can actually uh, give lower greenhouse gas footprints. We can look at biofuels, hydrogen, ammonia, and synthetic e-fuels, synthetic fuels, or electric power from batteries charged from the grid. Now, the electric power was covered in, in the other uh, presentation, so I, I will not go uh, into much into that. But I will try to show you some figures on these conventional, uh, conventional fuels and, and how they can compare to what's going on today. So we're always comparing to marine gas oil, that's or, or uh, low sulfur uh, heavy fuel oil. So in these figures, you uh, see the vertical dashed green line is the marine gas oil on the diesel engine. And that's what we call the 100%. So that, that's the emission basis that we're looking at. If uh, uh, we look at a, a marine gas oil on a dual fuel auto cycle engine, it has an increased uh, emission because it uses more fuel. It's, it's less efficient than the diesel engine. This is, this is no. If we look at, um, um, and, and we can, uh, in this picture, we also look at the different global warming pot uh, potentials uh, on the left side in a 20 year perspective and on the right side in a 100 year perspective. So what's the difference? Well, methane, for instance, um, has a global warming potential, uh, which is higher in the 20 year perspective than in a 100 year perspective, because methane has a very short lifetime in the atmosphere. So you release it and within 10 years, most of it's gone. If you have CO2, um, uh, the story goes that CO2 has a residence time in the atmosphere of more than 100 years. So it takes more time to dissipate the effects of it. And this figure basically just tells the same, uh, same story. It's important to understand what is the basis of your comparisons when you are trying to compare and see what kind of benefits do you get from the different types of engines and different fuels? So as you can see from the figures, you get quite different answers if you look at the 20 year potential or the 100 year potential, and if you use different type of engine technologies. I would like to, to just briefly dip into this um, engine technology side, because when it comes to uh, the issue of methane slip, uh, there are quite a few um, misunderstandings about. Methane slip is something that happens when you do not combust all of the methane that goes into the engine as fuel. And this is typical for a auto cycle engine, uh, where you premix the fuel with air before it enters the cylinder. So the, the fuel in the air is premixed, sucked into the uh, cylinder, and then this, this combined gas is compressed in the cylinder. And what happens when you do that, when you compress it, it tends to fill every crevice within the cylinder. So it fills up all the volumes between the, uh, the piston and the cylinder wall, for instance, and it also migrates to the, to the cylinder wall. And now inside the cylinder, while everything is happening fast and combustion is happening, the cylinder wall is relatively cool. And that's where uh, it is hard to combust methane. And in all these crevices, uh, you probably have a less, um, uh, or you have a richer mixture of uh, methane with air, and you cannot combust it. 
So when the combustion is over, you open the exhaust valve and you expand the gas, then this unburned methane will follow the gas through to the exhaust side. That's what is called methane slip. And that happens typically in auto cycle engines and it's relatively unavoidable. You can reduce it quite a lot, either using uh, measures in the exhaust stream or you can also use measures in the uh, combustion uh, process. But for a diesel cycle dual fuel engine where you directly inject the fuel into the cylinder after the air has been compressed and you do not premix air and, and uh, fuel, you can in principle have no methane slip at all. You burn all of the methane. Uh, some of these engines do have methane slip and that's due to the physical design of the engine, but that can be alleviated. So it's quite important to know this. Um, jumping into biofuels. Biofuels can be very, very good. And they can uh, still, in this figure, we use the vertical um, uh, green line, which is the marine gas oil on a diesel engine. 100% is the vertical green dashed line. Biofuels are all over the place. And you probably heard that. Biodiesel from palm oil in this figure shows about a 300% um, uh, emission compared to marine gas oil on a diesel engine. Well, if you look at the other end at biogas, or you look at, for instance, biofuels from uh, crops, residues and waste, you can have a very, very high uh, impact from, from using biofuels. So with your, uh, a diesel engine, dual fuel on biogas, uh, you can uh, get maybe down to about 20% of the marine gas soil um, emissions. So 80% saving. That's quite important. But if you do it wrong, you get a lot more uh, CO2 or, or greenhouse gas emissions. Also with hydrogen and ammonia, hydrogen and ammonia are just carriers of energy. And um, ammonia is a carbon free fuel. It's not an environmentally friendly fuel. It's, um, it's a toxic and, and corrosive fuel, but um, it can be used as a non-carbon fuel. And as this figure shows, if you produce um, uh, hydrogen or ammonia from renewable electricity, you can get as low as 0%. So you have no emissions at all, not in the production and not in the use. If, however, you look at the situation today where you steam reform uh, hydrogen from natural gas, uh, 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 hydrogen will give you a higher total greenhouse gas emission if you use it today as is. And also if you put in uh, and use electrolysis on the EU mix of uh, electricity, you get very much higher. So you get more than double your uh, total greenhouse gas emissions from using hydrogen or ammonia today as it is. So this is trying to show what is the difference between starting to use it today and what might be in the future if we are able to produce everything from renewable electricity. And that's a question I will get back to a little bit later on. So what about these synthetic e-fuels? Um, e-fuels are uh, fuels that are made from hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and they are blended in a synthesis process and made into a hydrocarbon. So you can design the hydrocarbon. You can make a gas or you can make a liquid. Um, I'll just jump uh, likely through this one, but uh, there is, uh, it's important also to, to know that when you're talking about all of these different fuels there, uh, people use many, many, many ways of describing that. And it's uh, very important to have a consistent comparison methodology. So in, uh, in our communications, we always consistently label fuels as gray if they are purely from fossil uh, sources. We uh, label them blue if they are from fossil sources, including carbon capture. Uh, and we uh, label them green if they are totally renewable all the way from production to use. And then we use uh, also the orange color to say it's any blend between the gray, blue, uh, blue and green. And this is uh, uh, an important slide because it shows that uh, if this, this slide tries to show the um, amount of energy you put into your fuel compared to the amount of usable energy you get out of it. So for every unit usable energy you get out, this is the 
relative amount of energy you put into the fuel. So if you compare from uh, our uh, current suite of fossil fuels, I said uh, almost uh, or 98% of all fuels used in shipping is fossil based. Uh, if you go to hydrogen or ammonia, you double the energy input in order to get the same amount of usable energy out. And if you would like to make uh, uh, the synthetic fuels, you triple the amount of energy uh, in order to get the same amount of usable energy out. There have been a lot of uh, work uh, done on trying to estimate the future cost of uh, these fuels. And if you look at what the um, uh, IMO, fourth IMO greenhouse gas study and uh, the Lloyd uh, Register and UMass studies has shown, today in the high price estimate, you would see a difference between the current fuels, which we set at one, um, see that LNG is about 25% uh, higher, uh, hydrogen and ammonia is four times higher cost, and synthetic fuels today about 10 times the cost of very low sulfur oil today. But if you look into the future and you take into account that the main driver of the difference in cost is the energy input, then these figures are one for the very low sulfur oil, two for hydrogen and ammonia, and three for green e diesel. So what are the pros and cons then? Hydrogen and ammonia are expensive fuels, and they will always be, because they require a lot of energy input. What is not so much on the table when we're discussing hydrogen and ammonia is that risk, measure, uh, risk levels will increase uh, compared to what we're operating on today. Even when you do the right measures, it will increase. You require new and complex infrastructure on board. You cannot use anything that you already have. You have to have new stuff on board. And you also require everything on shore in production, distribution, and bunkering infrastructure has to be brand new. You have to make everything all over again. Um, you have to design the vessels differently because hydrogen has a very low uh, energy content. You cannot gradually introduce this because you cannot blend it with what, uh, what is already existing. It requires a totally new business model for shipping. And the higher cost is both in the fuel and the infrastructure. If we go the way to synthetic fuels, they are even more expensive than hydrogen and ammonia. As I said, they require three times the, the amount of energy, whereas hydrogen and ammonia requires two times the, uh, the amount of energy. So it's 50% more expensive in terms of energy input. But the risk levels are exactly the same that we have today because you're producing a hydrocarbon that you're using today. It uses the exact same infrastructure on board. You can use the exact same engines, the exact same pumps, tanks, and so on. And also for distribution, production, bunkering on shore, exact same. You don't have to make anything new when it comes to this. So all of these costs disappear. All of the costs that you need in addition to the increased cost of hydrogen and ammonia is now gone if you go to synthetic fuels. You get a higher price for the fuel, but no additional cost. And it can be used on, on any vessel. It can be used on, on all existing uh, ships. And it can be gradually blended in to, uh, to any ship and in, in any amount. And then finally, I, I have two, two uh, more uh, slides, I think. The question here is, this, these figures show the total amount of energy produced uh, uh, or, or um, uh, energy uh, that is fossil based produced in 1990 and in 2018. So it increased from about 8,800 million tons of oil equivalent to about 14,000 million tons of oil equivalents between 1990 and, 19, uh, and 2018. And what you can say is that coal actually increased its share from 25 to 27%, while oil decreased uh, its uh, share. Natural gas increased its share. And you can see all of the renewables have basically moved just slightly. So the question is then, if we are going to produce everything from renewables and everyone else is going to uh, remove oil, natural gas, and coal with, re uh, and coal with renewables, how are we going to make that happen? And just as an input, 
to discussion and reflection. If you use the, um, if you take the as is today, so this figure says 400 million tons of oil equivalents used by shipping. I said 300 earlier. This figure says 400. It's uh, not always uh, easy to to fix the figure. But if we take 400 million ton, tons of oil equivalent used by shipping. If you want to change that to e-fuels, you would have to use 710 million tons of oil equivalent in energy. If you want to, um, uh, you could take that from renewables. If you do that, you would then reduce uh, the global uh, CO2 emissions by, or greenhouse gas emissions by 3%. If you took the exact same amount of energy and you replaced coal, electricity, coal-fired electricity production, you would reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by 20% for the exact same input of energy. And we think that's also an important aspect to uh, keep in the back of your mind when you're looking at what kind of solution you're going to go for in the future. Thank you. That was me. Okay, thank you, Anel. Very good presentation with a lot of uh, information. Uh, one question uh, rise from your presentation. Uh, nowadays, everyone is talking about the uh, production of, uh, of the hydrogen. So people are not familiar what is the difference between green, blue, gray, orange hydrogen. So yep. could you please give some uh, explanation? You had uh, that slide, so yeah. it will be very good to show it because everyone think that hydrogen uh, produced from uh, natural gas or from renewable electricity is the hydrogen. But in uh, European legislation is not uh, lead on the same way. So it's uh, uh, not the same. So please uh, short explanation about uh, hydrogen. Yeah, this is the one, uh, the, the slide you were talking about. So yeah. uh, basically, uh, uh, it's true. There is no uh, real uh, consistent way of talking about these things. But I think that uh, uh, if you look at the different uh, publications on these issues, people tend to say that uh, if you're talking about gray hydrogen, for instance, it comes from uh, steam reforming of natural gas without any handling of the CO2 emissions that comes from it. So that's a gray um, hydrogen or ammonia. If you call it blue, that's when you uh, also produce it from steam reforming uh, of natural gas, but you capture the carbon. And it's quite important to know that nobody does that today, but, but that's uh, a potential, potential way of producing it. So blue is a potential way of producing it. Gray is what is happening today. So gray is the production of hydrogen from steam reforming of natural gas and just letting the CO2 emissions go into the atmosphere. That's what's happening today. Blue is what you could do if you uh, can get the uh, carbon capture and storage going. And then the green labeling is if everything you do uh, starts with renewable energy. So in Norway, for instance, we have hydropower, which is uh, still considered uh, renewable. Um, it has a very, uh, it doesn't have zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I think that uh, the uh, current figure is about 12, 12 or 15 grams of CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour from hydro, more or less. Um, but it's very, very close to, to uh, being zero. Uh, wind energy has about 12, I think, um, and solar approximately the same, around 10. But that's what we call green. So if it's from renewables, we call it green. And then we have made the orange figure, uh, uh, orange color as well, to just to confuse everybody, um, because it's a, any blend of uh, the gray, blue, and green. So there are different ways of, of producing it. And we say that if you are uh, blending from different sources, uh, then it's orange. So I hope that was a little bit clarifying. Yeah, that uh, orange is also new for me. So I didn't know for orange hydrogen. I, I heard for blue, green, uh, yeah, gray, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we, um, we made that. So <laughs> it's, uh, maybe it's just confusing, but uh, we see that from time to time that there's a mix of, of sources for uh, hydrogen and ammonia. Okay, so one more question. Uh, yep. 
they said uh, there are 100,000 merchant ships on the market. What yeah. is your opinion on the order book of zero emission ships? How long will it take to replace the fleet with the zero emission vessels? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, uh, I think that, uh, first of all, the uh, maritime industry is, um, they're very good at uh, sticking to regulations. So if there are regulations and there are um, uh, heavy penalties uh, in using the, call it the wrong type of technology, the maritime industry responds and starts using the right type of technology. So they have shown that time and time again, they have a very good track record. If you put regulations in place, then you get the results. So uh, basically, uh, if everybody just agreed that everything should be, let's say, um, uh, 50% better in 2030 or 2040, it will happen because the maritime industry is very good at making it happen. Um, right now, as you say, uh, the, the number of ships in the global fleet, um, there are a lot of them. Uh, um, Tomislav was talking about, um, uh, I don't know if you, I said your name correctly, so apologies if I didn't, but it's you correct. were talking it's about correct. electrical um, uh, vessels. And if you look at what DNVGL, they, they keep track of, of electrical vessels and battery operated vessels in the world. And uh, it's uh, numbering in the few hundreds. I think it's around four, 400 or maybe 500 ships uh, that have batteries in some form. So some of them are all electric and some of them are hybrids using diesel machinery uh, with um, batteries, for instance. Um, so if you compare that four or 500 ships with batteries on board, for instance, to the 100,000, you, you get a, a, an idea of where we are. We are just starting. And I think it's important to realize that we're just starting. And I think it's important to realize that we need to go slow at the beginning to find these good solutions. So what was presented uh, earlier here is exactly that. It's finding these good solutions. What we're doing in Norway with our uh, fjord crossing ferries is finding the solutions, learning how to do this. And when we've learned it, it's much easier to get uh, to scale it and to know how to scale it efficiently. So uh, it's important that we don't run like headless chickens and try everything uh, all at the same time, because then, then uh, it will be really hard to change, change uh, the global fleet. And it's also important to remember that the IMO is still saying uh, um, uh, a 40% reduction in, green, uh, in CO2 emissions by 2030 and a 50% in total greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. They're not talking about 100% reduction. That, that should happen later on, according to the IMO. So it's important to understand that and see the scale that you need to do. Uh, uh, the scale is huge. Scale is really, really huge. But um, uh, according to the research we do, we see that there are a lot of solutions that you can take right now and implement in new ships um, that will actually bring us to those different targets that the IMO is setting. Um, so we think that it should be possible to reach those targets by 2030 and 2050. Um, and we know that the maritime industry is very good at responding to actual regulations. But as you also know, the, the maritime industry is about money. So, so um, if no regulations are in place, uh, they will do what uh, is cheapest. And if you put regulations in place, they will follow them. So that's my answer. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. So there is in the chat uh, discussion about uh, how many orders of uh, new electric ships, but I will ask you the question about uh, hydrogen. We had a short discussion before the start of the webinar. Yeah. Your view on the using of the hydrogen experience. Uh, we talk about uh, projects in Norway. Yeah. So uh, battery, hydrogen, electric, uh, e-fuels, LNG, uh, your opinion. Uh, where and when, how to say? Yeah, OK. So uh, I think that uh, uh, Norway has uh, uh, basically led the way on battery operated or some battery operated vessels. So uh, we have um, our fjord crossing ferries, and we are now basically changing most of them into being battery operated. 
So all of them will be electric or, or most of them will be electric. I think there's something like 65 or 70 all electric ferries uh, on order right now in Norway. Um, if uh, you look at the hybrid uh, operated uh, vessels, uh, there are a lot of different uh, types of hybrids and, and some of them can get very, very good solutions and, and very, very uh, much reduction in, in uh, fuel use uh, when you do it correctly. Um, and then, of course, we are looking into hydrogen. And right now there is one project on one ferry that is going to be built for liquid hydrogen. And it's a, it's a research uh, project. So it's, it's learning how to do it. Uh, it will not lead to any emission cuts. It would actually lead to about 70 to 100% more emissions uh, due to the fact that you don't get uh, green hydrogen today. But it will pave the way to learn more about it. Um, but uh, I, I think that uh, uh, it's hard to make uh, the argument for uh, hydrogen as a, as a huge energy carrier for the maritime because of the things that I said in one of these slides, that you actually need to change everything if you do that. Everything needs to change. Um, and the question is, why would we want to do that? If we can make synthetic fuels, and they are still in the research stage, that's true, but everything has been in the research stage at one point or the other, and we need to develop them. But if we develop them, we can get something that goes to zero emissions, and uses the infrastructure we have today. And that is important because it uses much, much less resources than if you start using hydrogen and ammonia as it is. Yeah, 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 that, that's the, it's a, we have very short goal, a deadline is very short and we are still, uh, how to say, playing uh, between uh, different yep. technologies. Yes. But it's it's important that uh, it's important that even though uh, there is a short deadline and uh, you might uh, feel a little bit stressed about it, it's important to, um, uh, as we say in Norway, breathe with the stomach. It's like uh, take a deep breath and sit down and think about the problem and how to solve it, and not just try to solve it in panic, but try to really think about how to get the good solution and then how to scale it. That's the important thing. So, and uh, yeah, one question. Uh, what about, uh, how, it's very good question. So it, they say it's, uh, uh, they're looking for cheaper solution to reduce the emissions. Uh, they are ordering new ships with uh, scrubbers and uh, things like that. So what is the uh, status with that? Uh, what's your opinion? Is it going to reduce enough or is just to, how to say, uh, stay alive until the next uh, deadline. So, <laughs> well, uh, th that's an interesting question, of course. Uh, scrubbers um, are being installed to meet the uh, sulfur oxide uh, requirements. And um, uh, when, uh, if you go a couple of years back, uh, it was uh, a quite uh, good solution uh, in economic terms because uh, the price difference between the very low sulfur fuel oil and the heavy fuel oil was quite big. So you could play in, in that gap. Now it turns out um, after the um, uh, regulations were uh, put into force uh, last year, uh, the very low sulfur fuel oil uh, turns out to be not so expensive after all. So the question is then, uh, are you really saving anything by going for the scrubber solution? And the scrubber solution uh, increases your energy use by a couple of percent. So uh, it basically increases your greenhouse gas emissions. But um, uh, the more interesting question is, so um, what happens if you can capture CO2 on board your ship? So if you can have carbon capture on board your ship together with a scrubber solution for the uh, sulfur oxide, maybe you then can reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, run on cheap heavy fuel oil and, re and uh, remove the sulfur uh, emissions as well. Maybe that's a cheaper solution overall. Oh, okay. So, so that so, was, um, yeah, that yeah. was the question. What are the solutions? CCS uh, was the question. CCS is, uh, is uh, one of the things we are actually, uh, we are starting a project right now where we're looking at 
carbon capture on board and technologies that are suitable for carbon capture on board. So the carbon capture industry has been uh, land-based so far. They have a lot of space and it uh, doesn't matter how much it weighs and, and how big it is. Uh, on board the ship, of course, it does matter how much it weighs and how big it is. And it's really huge as it is right now. So uh, there needs to be quite a lot of development in, in reducing the size, making it more compact, more efficient and so on. Uh, and that's what we're going to look into. But if you can find a solution there, uh, you can still operate on, on uh, cheap oils. And maybe it's also good that we could burn this uh, re residual oil. Okay. So thank you very much. A lot of uh, questions, a lot of very good answers. Uh, uh, I think only uh, one additional question to Tomislav regarding the hydrogen and the electricity. Anders, thank you very much. So Tomislav, if you are here, uh, your opinion, hydrogen electricity on, uh, on board, uh, on, on the ship vessels, uh, especially the short routes, uh, how to say, uh, and your experience, in your experience, what will happen if you go with the hydrogen and registering your ship? Uh, you had a lot of problems with electricity, what will be with the hydrogen, how to say? Well, it will be the same. We have been discussing the hydrogen some 10 years for, for, the, for the city of Shibanik in Croatia. And because at that point of time, the, the battery technology wasn't at place. So we have been discussing with the city of Shibanik would, if it's possible to, to try to do something with hydrogen. And then the um, city of Shibanik told us we don't want to go to hydrogen at this point because at the moment, some journalists will start to write about the, 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 the pressure tank of 700 or 900 bars. The, the newspaper will start to write about that you are carrying around the, the, the bomb with yourself. So the, this is something I would say, um, like understood before, it has to go slow steps and you have to learn the public that this is not that, uh, uh, that the safety is on the place and it's not that dangerous as it is. So uh, sympathizing with the public over the time, yeah, it's crucial. Uh, when you're comparing hydrogen batteries, I would say batteries for the short routes and the hydrogen for the longer run. Longer run, I don't think that we are at the point uh, for the uh, ocean sailing. It's still without the domestic waters or uh, neighboring countries and uh, using the battery batteries is uh, kind of silent type of usage hydrogen you can use with uh, combustion engines or you can uh, use it with a few cells and it's up to the technology and if you are getting back uh, with hydrogen to combustion and engines i would say this is not the direction uh, you should go. It, it should be. It should go to the fuel cells. Then th this is the ecological part, but then it's also the the part of the uh, noise vibration. It's it's a different kind of feeling. Uh, you know how it's in uh, electric cars comparing to the to the, to the classic one. So the 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 feeling you have on board or uh, the value of uh, commodity it's on the higher level when you are sailing sailing vessel. Okay, okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, there is one question. <laughs> are you not afraid that your innovation will be taken over by shippers in China? <laughs> and will it be possible to maintain uh, reserve production in European shipyards? Will orders be placed in Chinese uh, you know, shipyards? So that is uh, one last question and one uh, question will be go for under so tom your uh, answer on this you are uh, protecting your idea no no i have learned from from the regions that one that uh intellectual properties for the pharmaceutical industry or something like that where you have to protect uh, um, cheap product with a, a high margin on it but in technology, you just have to uh, develop fast. And at the point when they are copying you, you are developing something new and you're going further. That's my feeling how it should be. 
Um, there is one uh, great professor in Croatia. He told once to me that these days you can find any kind of uh, patent globally. There is lots of patent search. You have Google patent search, but you will never find who is using your patent easily. So you have to have the army of lawyers all over the world. So um, patenting, it's not something I'm foreseen as, 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 as a future of technology protection. Okay. And uh, uh, thank you, Tomo. And Anders, last question for you. Uh, where, we, where will be stored CO2 captured on the board? Yes, uh, uh, when you capture it on board, you would have to um, uh, store it in uh, uh, liquefied form. Uh, some people are also talking about storing it in solid form, but uh, you will have to, to store it in, in a tank. So that's part of, um, uh, you probably need to, to take away one of your cargo tanks or, or you need some space to store it. And it's, uh, it will be in liquid form. So you need a pressure vessel in order to, to contain it. And uh, also an insulated pressure vessel in order to contain it. So yes, there are a lot of questions that need to be solved and we need to figure out how to do it. But you know, the question really is how expensive do the politicians want uh, these things to be? So if they just put uh, a lot of uh, taxes on uh, the fossil alternatives, um, then you get the price differential that you can play with. And that's where um, we need to figure out how to do this and how, how uh, it's, it's not cheap, but um, how low can you go when it comes to price for these different solutions? That's what we need to figure out. And that's what we are doing in, in R&D. And uh, as to the, I, I think uh, Thomas Lau gave a very good question uh, or, or answer to this uh, question of, of the Chinese taking over the market. I mean, when you're, uh, when you're talking about um, uh, what we call high technology or advanced solutions, uh, that's uh, where you have an advantage and an edge. Uh, once this becomes mainstream, it's really, really hard to keep it away from the cheaper labor. But uh, as long yeah. as it's, uh, it requires uh, competence and high competence, you have the edge. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, so more or less we are finished, answered on the all questions. So what about the uh, status in China regarding the electric uh, and e-fuels and uh, do they have any research? Any, any uh, like pilots, did they build something, Tomo or Anders? Do you know something about what is happening in the China? Because, you know, China, South Korea, uh, they are the biggest player in this uh, field, so. I, I could try to answer a little bit. Uh, we know that they are moving um, uh, quite rapidly on LNG. So uh, liquefied natural gas and solutions when it comes to shipping. So they have been doing quite a lot uh, with regard to that. When it comes to batteries and uh, so on, I really don't know the status. And uh, also when it comes to hydrogen, I'm not, fam uh, I do not, I'm not familiar with uh, any Chinese uh, initiatives on, on that, but uh, it might be much more on the automotive side uh, that they're moving. Yeah, me, me neither. I, I don't know about the electric buses from China at all. So the, the most electric vessels, they come from Norway. That's my mm. feeling. And then you have some small scale electric vessels, but they are actually not electric vessels. They are the, the electric yachts. Uh, so the small vessels up to 10 meters and they, they call it the electric vessels. That's something you will find all over the world. Mm. Uh, small scale uh, without any kind of uh, sustainability or the autonomy it's just like uh, prototyping on, on on small small scale that's that's what i know i, I can uh, i see that there's a a, a statement in um, in one of the uh, uh, or in the chat saying that uh, solar panels and batteries are chinese made i think it's quite important to know that uh, uh, while uh, a lot of uh, electric vehicle batteries are made in china uh, batteries for ships are very different. You cannot use uh, car batteries on board ships. They will just, uh, they will die quickly. So you have to use uh, a very different type of technology. 
because ships have a very, very different operational profile than a car does. So uh, yes, they're producing a lot, but um, currently um, there are uh, the ones that are making uh, electric uh, or, or batteries for ships are European. And uh, they're using cells from, uh, from Asia, that's true, but, uh, but set, uh, putting them together and making them into something that can be used on board ships, that's European. Okay, so we have uh, here a link in the chat about the uh, world first all electric cargo ship from uh, China. Mm. So, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. they're working, and that's true with the batteries, uh, they are not the same with the uh, with, uh, in, in the case of the vessels, and in the case of the cars, and especially the, when you look for the capacity, fast charging of those batteries. Toma, you mentioned something with uh, having batteries on the mainland. So I have opportunity to discuss with uh, Danfoss uh, and they had they implemented something in Norway with uh, batteries on the islands uh, and the ship when arrive uh, charge from the uh, from those batteries uh, not directly from the grid in order to have the stability so and they need a lot of energy in a very very quick uh, uh, time so batteries can need to have resistance need to stay alive how to say uh, because you have a lot of charging and discharging, but very quick and very, very uh, strong charging, how to say. So thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, we had two presentations, but one and a half hour. I think it's enough uh, with a lot of questions. Actually, uh, we had like a discussion panel, not a presentation. So thank you all for uh, attending. Uh, to our attendees, to our panelists, a uh, very good presentation. So we saw uh, different uh, technology, different approach. In the future, we are also expecting to create uh, additional webinars with this topic, with uh, this problematic and about uh, how to register your ship, uh, what are the problems. Uh, and we are looking for uh, topics uh, which are very interesting in this field, actually, because the field is very new. And uh, I know that a lot of people, a lot of companies working, but uh, we don't see the final products on the, on the market. Uh, at the moment, everything is on the small scale and the big projects are basically on the like uh, testing and uh, on the pilot scale. So thank you all. Thank you, Tomo. Thank you, Anders. Uh, it was very good. And I hope that attendees have uh, uh, heard enough, uh, heard a lot of good things. So at the end, we will uh, send presentation to all attendees uh, to see what is happening. Also, the webinar is recorded. It will be on YouTube. And uh, everyone will receive like some small questionnaire after the ending of the webinar to help us to see what is the situation with the research and in this field. So thank you all. And bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.